Okay. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? So it's really a pleasure to be here, first time, and also as a speaker, so double badge. Uh, I'm a professor at Imperial College, so I work on um, different topics in machine learning. And today I would like to uh, talk about uh, deep learning on graphs. Right? So I guess in this community I don't need to advertise deep learning. It had a long and bumpy history, maybe under different names. But I think in the past several years it has uh, changed quite, several, quite a few industries and markets and uh, academic communities. In particular, if you look at uh, computer vision and image analysis, you can see that uh, deep learning has had a, a profound impact on this community. And nowadays, basically everything is based on deep learning in computer vision. Now, if we look at the main focus of uh, research in, uh, in deep learning, it has been mainly focused on data or kinds of data where um, we can call them Euclidean. Basically, there is some kind of underlying grid structure. Images are a very good example. They can be represented as two-dimensional grids, audio signals, or one-dimensional grids, and so on and so forth. But we also, in many cases, need to deal with data that doesn't have this grid structure. We can call it non-Euclidean. Probably social networks are uh, the most prominent example. These are graphs where nodes represent users and edges represent social relations, right? And uh, basically, there are other examples of data that can be modeled as a graph. You can think of it almost as a ubiquitous model for any kind of relations or interactions between stuff, right? So you can find it in biology, you can find it in brain imaging, you can find it in computer graphics application where you can model maybe slightly more complicated structures, the meshes, uh, you can represent three-dimensional objects. So bottom line, there is really need, there is a lot of applications across a broad spectrum of domains where we need to deal with this new type of data. Okay, so just to give you an example of a few uh, applications and different sorts of applications that we can encounter in this context. So uh, I think something happened to my, <laughs> yeah. So this is an example of uh, a graph that models a molecule, right? So atoms will be nodes and chemical bonds will be uh, uh, edges. And we want to extract some features that predicts certain properties of this molecule. For example, if we are in the business of drug design, we want to predict whether this drug will be efficient, whether it will be toxic, whether it can be dissolved in water, and so on and so forth. Right? So basically, given a graph, we want to, to classify uh, this graph. Right? So if we take an analogy, uh, make an analogy to some uh, problems, let's say, in computer vision, this is like uh, object classification. Right? I want to tell that this image contains a cat. Another type of problems uh, are vertex-wise classification. For example, if we are in a social network and we have some, let's say, demographic data about the users, we would like to predict the way they voted in the past elections, right? So again, an analogy to computer vision, it's like semantic segmentation. We want to label each pixel in the image, whether it belongs to background, foreground, whether it's person, uh, car, et cetera. Right? We can also distinguish between settings where we have a fixed graph, like in a social network, at least at some snapshot of time, the network is fixed, versus applications like in computer vision and graphics where uh, basically the domain changes. So if we model three-dimensional objects as surfaces or as graphs, uh, basically each object comes with its own graph. Right? So we want to train our models on a collection of such graphs and then apply them to previously unseen ones. And finally, we can also distinguish between settings where the graph is known and given, like a social network, versus cases where the graph is latent or maybe partially known or noisy. So we want to learn not only some features on this graph, but also the graph itself. Okay, we want to reconstruct. There are many applications, especially in uh, biological and natural sciences. Okay, basically what we are trying to generalize to graphs are uh, convolutional neural networks. So convolutional neural networks, as probably most of you know, are a very successful paradigm that uh, is working very well in, uh, analysis, in the analysis of images, in uh, text analysis, in speech analysis. So basically, roughly speaking, it consists of two basic operations. These are convolutions and pooling operations. Convolution, you can think of it as a bank of filters, basically a sliding window that you run through your image, and uh, the coefficients of this filter are learnable and you determine them in an optimization procedure that is called training. 
uh, and pulling just down samples usually in a non-linear way the image. So it basically somehow averages or takes maximum of blocks of pixels. Okay, so basically this way you create a hierarchical representation of your image. And uh, in terms of computational complexity, it has a fixed number of parameters per filter. So it's independent on the input size. You can run it on very large images. And the complexity is linear. So it scales uh, as order of n, where n is the number of pixels, the input size. Okay? So the question is how do we do something like this on graphs? And if in images or in general on grid-like data, it is very easy. On image, you can think of running a sliding window throughout the image. How do we do it on graph, right? Basically, uh, how do we generalize convolution to graphs? So I don't have, unfortunately, a lot of time. So I will show you just one recipe. I will just mention that there are in the past several years. So this is a relatively new topic in machine learning. Actually, the origins of deep learning on graphs uh, are pretty old probably about 10 years old by machine learning standards. Uh, uh, it was before the deep learning hype, but let's say all the modern methods that are currently used are probably from the past two or three years. So we wrote the first review paper on this topic uh, last year. I would say it's already not up to date. There are several uh, follow-up papers that, that are more up to date and contain some of the more recent stuff and uh, this field is uh, evolving extremely fast. Okay, so this is a graph, and uh, let's say that we have some data on the graph, so we'll represent them as d-dimensional features, so we can re uh, represent it as a matrix of size n by d, okay? And basically this graph has uh, vertices and edges. Let's assume for simplicity that the graph is undirected, so the edges go both ways, right? And basically we can define an edge feature function, so I remi remind you that we want to do some kind of filtering operation on the graph. So on a graph, unlike an image, you do, you at each vertex you might have different number of neighbors. So basically what you can do, you can take pairs of uh, your vertices, right, or features at the vertices, denoted here as xi and xj. You might also have uh, edge features that encode information about relations between the vertices. So if you think of social network, for example, this can, be, this can capture some communication between users in some way, okay? So, and basically we have an edge feature function parametric function implemented usually as a small neural network that uh, basically takes this triplet of things, right? So uh, the uh, vertex and the edge features and produces some new uh, set, some, some new feature vector that is then aggregated. Now, another thing that is important to know about the graph, unless you provide some outside information, uh, there is no canonical way of ordering the vertices in your neighborhood, right? So basically it should be locally permutation invariant. Right, so this aggregation operation, usually it will be a summation or a maximum, but in general, let's denote it by this square operator, it can be something else, maybe even something learnable, right? So we aggregate this information, we get a generalization of a convolution. You can actually show that uh, the standard convolution on images can be implemented as a particular setting of this more general operation, okay? So this way you get a new set of features that could be potentially of different dimension at each vertex of the graph. So what is important, this is a local operation. It can be computed in a distributed way. So there are many ways of uh, making it efficient and parallelized, etc. We can also, so you can think of it as a kind of nonlinear operator acting on the features on the, of, the vertex, of the vertices and the edges and producing a new set of features. We can concatenate these, uh, these operations several times. So we can, for example, write it in terms of some function that is parameterized by another set of parameters that is applied to these, uh, to these uh, features. And basically, the w what we get is some kind of local uh, le learnable nonlinear operator. Okay, so an example of such operator, probably everybody is familiar here, is the Laplacian operator. Graph Laplacian operator. So what Laplacian does, it averages in some maybe weighted way the features in the neighborhood vertices and then subtracts the value of the feature at the central vertex itself and does it for every location in the graph. Okay, so basically you can interpret convolution in terms of uh, in the spectral domain, basically looking at the eigenfunctions of this Laplacian. And you can implement filters using so applying some functions of this Laplacian. For example, a polynomial filter will be just taking powers of the Laplacian. So you can think of it as a kind of a diffusion process that is 
uh, controlled by these uh, coefficients of the polynomial. Okay, so this is an example of a very simple polynomial filter on a graph. So in this case, the graph is just a grid, so you can see how it looks like. It has radial symmetry that comes from the permutation, local permutation invariance of the vertices. Okay, so there are some other settings where the graph actually is represented in some Euclidean space. So it's an embedded graph. Basically, each vertice can be associated with some coordinates. Okay, in this case, if we have a local system of coordinates around each vertex, we can assign a set of weights in the system of coordinates, and these weights allow us to average locally the values of the features in the vertices. So you can think of this uh, as a kind of generalization of pixels. So in a patch, in an image, these weights will be just selecting the first pixel, the second pixel, and so on uh, in a patch. This is something more general, okay? And basically this way we can generalize convolution in a slightly different way. Basically it will be a spatial uh, generalization of the conversion. We call these patch operators. Okay, now about pooling. Basically pooling essentially, it essentially amounts to progressive coarsening of the graph. So for example, one simple way is to collapse uh, edges connecting pairs of vertices. And basically this way you have two vertices become a single vertex and for example, you can do the standard max pooling that is used in convolutional neural networks, just taking the maximum of the feature vectors in each of these pairs of vertices. Okay, so bottom line, you can represent it as a tree structure and uh, pooling basically works more or less the same way as it works in images. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about applications. Uh, I think applications are really exciting because as I said in the beginning, Graphs can be applied to model practically anything, so you find applications of graph neural networks uh, really across the board. So applications, for example, in uh, point cloud analysis. This is very uh, now very interesting, especially in the domain of self-driving cars. For example, you can see a car that drives with a LiDAR sensor, so it sees a 3D world around it. And it has to detect objects, so segment, do semantic, semantic segmentation, for example, tell apart the road from pedestrians, right? So these are some examples of uh, semantic segmentation of objects. Well, in this case, uh, these are synthetic objects, but the results are extremely accurate. So the input here is uh, a point cloud. This is something slightly more interesting. So these are scanned indoor environments, okay? And these methods can be applied to large scale scenes that can contain millions of points. So this is another interesting application. So this is, uh, I don't know if you have seen it probably. Uh, so these are uh, intriguing properties of convolutional neural networks that boil down to the fact that uh, the mapping from the input to the output is very non-smooth. So basically they can be uh, fooled by what is called the adversarial perturbations. Essentially you can uh, modify very uh, minutely the input image and make the neural network, for example, uh, that classifies your images to classify it incorrectly. So imagine that you're, you have a self-driving car that uh, has a neural network that is trained to, to recognize traffic signs. If I put some stickers on this traffic sign in a certain way, I will be able to fool the network. So instead of stopping the car, it will run at full speed and will kill somebody, right? So maybe a, a little bit apocalyptic <laughs> example, but, but at least in principle it's possible. So even more weird examples, you can change one pixel in an image in a data dependent way, obviously. So uh, I can patch one pixel in this cat and the convolutional neural network that is trained almost perfectly to recognize uh, different objects will recognize it not as a cat, but as a bird, okay? And even more worrisome, so all these examples are data dependent. So the, the way that the perturbation is designed depends on the input. You can design even universal perturbations. So give me your neural network as a black box or a gray box. I will be able to design a single perturbation image that when added to the input, and it's almost imperceivable, it will change the way that the neural network classifies it. And you see that you see some slight perturbation, but it's almost invisible, right? And nevertheless, the neural network classifies this image incorrectly, okay? And there is a, a zillion of different uh, ways of designing these, uh, these perturbations under different conditions that I don't have time to go into it. And uh, some cool examples, how for example, face recognition systems can be fooled by uh, specially designed glasses that you can put on. And it, it, uh, some convolutional neural network will recognize you as somebody else. 
Okay, so basically, what uh, what does it have to do with graphs? Basically, the idea is we uh, we call it uh, peer nets. So it's basically it's a regularization la la layer in standard convolutional neural networks, whatever you like, whether you like residual networks or uh, something else, whatever whatever you want. Basically, we insert it somewhere between the standard convolutional and pooling layers, and basically, the, this uh, regularization layer takes uh, features from uh, neighbor images. Right? So basically, you don't consider a single image like in standard convolutional neural network, but you also exploit the space of images, its geometric structure. And this geometric structure is encoded as, uh, in the form of a graph, so it's a kind of, well, kind of averaging uh, in, in a special way, in a learnable way of your neighbors. And you can see that uh, it significantly uh, improves the robustness of neural networks against these kind of adversarial perturbations. And well, I will skip some examples, but here is uh, the, ki the kind of noise that fools a standard neural network. This is the amount of noise, and also you see that it is much more structured that is required to fool uh, the peer regularized neural network. So basically, it's not any more imperceivable. Okay, another application, somebody mentioned Netflix in the beginning. Uh, so I, I guess everybody knows Netflix, right? So Netflix is probably one of the canonical examples of a recommender system. They even ran a prize of $1 million for improving their results. Basically, uh, you have a huge matrix of users versus movies, right? And each user gives a score to a movie, right? But of course, we have only limited lifetime, so we can uh, watch that many movies. Basically, this is a very sparse matrix, right? And they want to uh, interpolate the missing values. They want to predict whether a user would like a movie or not. Right? So they want to predict the scores that the user have not provided. And usually it's solved as an algebraic problem, uh, fitting some low dimensional uh, solution to the given data. Usually it's done by uh, minimization of some convex proxy of the rank function. So you try to find the matrix with the smallest number of uh, independent rows and columns that explain the data. Uh, usually it's, uh, well, it's an NP hard problem, so it's replaced by what is called a nuclear norm. So it's the convex proxy for the, for the rank. So bottom line, this algebraic formulation doesn't have any geometric structure, right? If I shuffle the rows and the columns of this matrix, I will not change the rank. If I have an entire column missing, I can fill it in infinitely many ways. So this is a problem that is called cold start. Uh, when a new user arrives with no uh, scores given to any movie, basically, you don't know what to do with this user, right? So basically what we can do is we can add some extra information that can either come from the data itself or maybe from some out of band information, from maybe demographic features of the users. So it's a little bit naive model, but it works nicely in most cases. Uh, so it assumes uh, homophilic relations, meaning that if, think of this model, so you have a social network of users. So the graph here represents whether the users are related and uh, you can assume again, maybe naively, that friends have similar tastes. So now we can explain this data in terms of smoothness on this graph, right? So we can say that if I move from one user to another user, I uh, will find similar scores. So it's also a low-dimensional model, but in a different way, basically. It can be, the, these metrics can be expanded in terms of small number of Laplacian eigenfunctions. So bottom line, we can write it again as some kind of learnable parametric diffusion operator that takes our data, diffuses it, and uh, compares it to the data. And the only set of parameters are these diffusion parameters that are independent on the input size. So usually these are big, hard optimization problems. Here we optimize just for the parameters of the networks. And it achieves, at least used to achieve about a year ago when we published this paper, state-of-the-art results. Actually, similar methods have been implemented uh, in industrial settings. So Pinterest, for example, has a recommender system that, well, slightly different algorithms, but similar ideas that can be applied to graphs with billions of nodes. Okay, so some applications from high energy physics. So this is the LHC, Large Hadron Collider, one of the biggest machines that was constructed by the humankind. Basically, uh, this is a giant ring that accelerates particles to almost the speed of light and bangs them together. And by banging them together, basically these kind of particle jets are created. So Basically, particles decay and create uh, hundreds or thousands of different other particles that have different properties, and they're uh, picked up by different types of detectors, and this is exactly what this plot represents. 
right? And in LHC, because particles come probably at millions per second, they detect such events uh, with very high frequency. So this device collects a lot of, lot of data. And only uh, most of it is it's boring. It's not interesting, so you can consider it as, as noise. So they want to quickly classify some interesting events that, for example, might contain hints of some new physics. For example, when the Higgs boson was experimentally c confirmed, uh, basically there was some filtering information, uh, filtering stage that uh, discarded most of the events and left only the interesting ones. And if you think that LHC is, uh, is a big device, think twice. So this is Ice Cube. This is the neutrino observatory on the South Pole. And really, this is uh, literally speaking the tip of the iceberg because the detector itself is carved into the ice. So it's uh, called Ice Cube because it's cubic kilometer of detectors. And the detectors look like this. So these are bowls containing photomultipliers when neutrinos are particles that have almost no mass. So they travel from astrophysical sources along straight lines or as straight as possible by uh, accounting for general relativity distortions. And usually they don't interact with matter, but in the very infrequent cases they interact, they create this uh, glow in the ice that in physical terms is called Cherenkov radiation. Bottom line, it is picked up by these detectors and uh, the picture looks like this. Okay, so here you see event, one event is some noise and another one is energetic astrophysical neutrino coming from some very distant object that is of interest to astronomers. And actually it has, it has been in the news uh, several months ago because it was the first time that IceCube allowed uh, what is called multi-messenger observation of a blazer, some mysterious center of some distant galaxy that emits uh, uh, neutrinos, probably there is a black hole in the middle. So basically it indicated uh, to our, other astronomers uh, where to look in the sky. Okay, and basically the problem here is how to detect neutrinos, so how to detect these interesting events. So the difficult part of this problem is that uh, neutrinos are extremely rare events. So we need here to work with extremely low false positive rate. Most of the events are background, they should be discarded. So we had a very recent paper that was presented just a few weeks ago where we showed uh, that we are able to beat uh, existing baselines with uh, graph convolutional neural networks. So in this case, the array of uh, detectors is treated as a graph and we even got uh, best paper awards for this thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. So another example of application is from brain imaging. So in this case, uh, well, basically you have multiple geometric domains. So it's uh, interesting. Basically in this case, we have a brain that can be modeled as a graph, basically spatially related uh, regions in the brain. You have different patients that can be also related uh, by, for example, similar genetic background or maybe a similar disease history or even gender. So basically we have similarities between patients and we also have uh, basically the temporal axis where we measure the response of the, of the brain or different regions, regions in, the, in the brain to uh, different stimuli. So these are functional MRI signals. And here there is a, a plethora of different tasks that can be addressed. For example, you can uh, automatically diagnose certain neurological diseases such as Alzheimer's disease based on these data or basically try to better understand how the brain works. Uh, I will mention two last applications. So one of them is from the, uh, from the domain of uh, pharmaceutics and computational chemistry or drug design. So I mentioned it in the beginning, basically you have uh, a molecule and you try to predict its properties. So the usual way it's done, well, obviously you can do it by experiment, but experiment is expensive and you cannot test billions of candidates. Unfortunately, the search space for drugs is uh, huge. It's bigger than the number of atoms in the universe. So usually you already know, you restrict uh, this, the search space by, for example, looking only at molecules of certain size or molecules that can be synthesized in the lab. And usually you do quantum mechanical simulations. Now with convolutional uh, 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 neural networks on graphs that model molecules as graphs, you can do at least as good as quantum mechanical simulations or a particular type of simplified simulations called DFT, but about five sort of, of magnitude faster. So this really opens new potentials for uh, virtual screening of uh, new drugs and materials. And even more interesting are uh, 
uh, direction is generative models where you try to uh, basically start with a set of properties and synthesize a graph or a molecule that has these properties. So you probably have seen examples of uh, generative models for images where you can synthesize human faces using, for example, generative adversarial networks. So something like this for graphs is a very cool and uh, still an open problem, but there are some results. So these are all synthesized molecules by a molecular generating network. You can predict side effects in uh, drugs. So you can, for example, instead of inventing new drugs and designing new molecules, you can use existing uh, drugs in different combinations. So this is called polypharmacy. And some of these combinations are known. Most of them are known. So basically there is no clinical trial that tells you what will happen if you take paracetamol with uh, amoxicillin or something like this. So some side effects might be innocuous, some of them might be uh, dangerous or even little for some people. So predicting these effects is extremely important in, in, in clinical medicine. You can also think of uh, protein-based drugs where the drug itself is not a small molecule but a protein, uh, basically a specially designed protein that binds to protein targets. So the target here is actually also it was in the news because uh, the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2018 was given for the discovery of this program death mechanism that is used in uh, oncological immunotherapies. So very briefly speaking, uh, basically it uh, blocks certain proteins that uh, signals to immune uh, system not to attack a cell and basically immune system can destroy cancer cells in this way by uh, activating this mechanism. So we are able to design proteins that will bind to these kind of uh, targets. So potentially it opens avenues for a new uh, class of drugs that could treat cancer. I will finish with the, probably the coolest application and this is fake news detection. So fake news are everywhere as you know, uh, right? Basically you open a newspaper and you don't know whether it's true or fake. So uh, obviously it's a big problem for companies like Facebook or Twitter. There is a lot of empirical evidence recently that shows that fake news spread differently on social media. And nowadays, obviously, everyone, especially the younger generation, uses social media as uh, the source of information. So there was a paper in Science uh, in the beginning of the past year that showed that uh, news on Twitter propagate differently depending on whether they're true or fake. So uh, the problem is that it's very hard to axiomatically determine what makes uh, basically a distinction between fake and true news. So what we can do, we can learn these features. So basically we use uh, uh, geometric deep learning, deep conversational neural networks on graph to learn uh, specific patterns that allow to characterize fake news and distinguish them from real news. So this is an example of a small portion of the Twitter social network. And the color here represents whether a user spreads fake news or true news and the black lines represent a cascade basically the way that uh, a piece of news spreads. So this is what we are doing in our startup Fabula and this is one second of shameless advertisement. Yeah. <laughs> Which I'm not supposed to do. Okay, so I think I will stop here. I think it's a very cool and exciting topic. Uh, there is uh, plenty of research going on in some of the leading machine learning groups around the world including in uh, our group at Imperial College. And there is a plenty of open problems. So yeah, if you're interested in research questions, then especially uh, generative models or large scale applications of these methods are extremely challenging and interesting. And uh, obviously you can try to apply uh, these kind of methods to your type of data if it can be represented as a graph or something like this. Okay, so I will finish here. Thank you very much. So, yes, you are, you are allowed an advert slide in the middle of your one because you've done a lovely talk. So we do allow that. Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. That one earlier. Is there any questions for Michael? We've got maybe a couple of questions for the break. Yes, the microphone's nearby you, near the chair, if you can find it. Thanks for making this complicated uh, talk so accessible. And the question is, do you have any like, software that would make this work easier with, like, say, um, some layers and PyTorch that you could use just for data? Yeah. So uh, there are several implementations. Well, obviously uh, our own implementation for some of the algorithms, but there was a recent library from uh, Google DeepMind, 
which I, I never used myself, but I heard that it's not great. Uh, and there are several other libraries. So we also, we have a website that is called geometricdeeplearning.com. So it has some examples of code, uh, references, etc. Yeah, but basically the short answer, there are several implementations of some of these algorithms. So basically it's, it's not a single algorithm, it's more of a research direction. So there are many different, many different approaches. One more question for over here, chap in the red jumper. Yep, cool, grab the microphone, thank you. So well, uh, these uh, the graph theoretical uh, features such as centrality and uh, and others. Uh, in principle, you can learn them basically with these methods. Uh, uh, the issue with uh, these handcrafted features, centrality might be good and discriminative feature for one application and not a good uh, feature for other applications. So same way with deep learning that you don't know a priori what is important and what is a good feature and what is not a good feature. You learn it from the data, uh, basically driven by the task. So same thing here. You might be able, if centrality is the feature that uh, is the, the right feature for your specific task, then hopefully the neural network will learn this feature, but it might be something else. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael.